Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, give this opening talk at uh, your event uh, today. And I want to thank Bernard and Mike for uh, inviting me. Uh, and I, I, I really wish uh, I was uh, there in person. I could meet you, interact with you, and also uh, revisit South Africa. I've only been South Africa once in 96. This is a photo of myself in the far north, uh, Limpopo province. And you might be surprised that I was there actually doing some science, doing some uh, field biology, but it wasn't plant pathology, it was entomology. Uh, I was there studying these beetles, tiger beetles of the genus Dromica, it's absolutely fascinating uh, South African uh, beetles. I suspect some of you know about them, um, uh, very uh, fearless, flightless uh, cisendelids, uh, which as you can see from those mandibles are um, very um, aggressive predators of uh, other insects. Anyways, I had a fantastic trip and fantastic memories, and um, um, I, I really um, would like to, to visit you again uh, one of these days. But uh, this is the South African Society for Plant Pathology, not the South African Society for Entomology. So I'll be uh, going back to my theme today, which is uh, plant pathology, and of course, this year we are um, celebrating the International Year for Plant Health. Uh, this is, uh, as you know, uh, a very important topic for our field, plant pathology. Uh, unfortunately, it was hijacked by another type of pathogen, but nonetheless, I think uh, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on some of the bigger questions related to uh, plant health and plant pathology. Uh, so this, again, will not come as a surprise to many of you. Um, plant diseases have increased in frequency uh, in the last years. Uh, increased trade, uh, meaning introduction of new pathogens. Uh, climate change also uh, is creating a lot of pressure on our crops. And of course, these pathogens evolved and occasionally they will jump from one host to another. Uh, in a way, similar to what we're seeing with, um, with that dreadful coronavirus. Uh, the same thing is happening with plant pathogen and occasionally you do have new pathogens emerging on crops because they move on from uh, wild plant populations. Nonetheless, despite all these new outbreaks, I have a feeling that plant pathology occasionally is one step behind in terms of diagnosing and, and really calling out uh, these new outbreaks, uh, especially, especially using the latest technology like genomics technology. So this is taken from uh, ProMed Mail, which is um, the one uh, organized system that really reports um, based on literature survey and, and news announcements that reports new outbreaks of um, plant diseases. And uh, if you uh, do like uh, what my colleague Ksenia Krasileva did is make a word cloud out of all these um, ProMed mail reports, uh, then you see that the word undiagnosed is actually the most common one. Uh, and that's really sad because we're really at the stage where with uh, genomics, with genetic analysis, it's fairly straightforward to actually diagnose uh, these pathogens almost in a large scale, high throughput fashion. Um, and and, and it, it really saddens me that many of these diseases, most of them are in developing countries, are, are really not being addressed using this uh, newest technology. So this is what where I start actually in this story, because back in 2012, I, I, I was looking at what's being done in with human and animal diseases. And I was really um, feeling quite sad actually and quite annoyed by the fact that plant pathology have, hasn't embraced um, genomics surveillance, genomics diagnostics in the same way as our colleagues working with um, biomedical problems or even with foodborne diseases. Um, have been dealing with with new outbreaks. Uh, so this is really the um, the starting point for me. So back in 2012, I wrote this commentary, which was really um, arising out of frustration, if you like. And then I thought, okay, I really uh, want to showcase how we can apply genomics technology to a new problem. So I told my lab, look, as soon as we hear of a, of a new problem, we should really um, apply our expertise to address that, that problem using genomics and so show, showcase how genomics can really impact this. 
an inspiration, uh, which is um, uh, something that is obviously very um, relevant today, is is this platform called Next Train. Uh, it's it's a wonderful platform. It was originally developed for the flu for influenza virus, and of course recently was applied to the um, SARS-CoV-2, the the coronavirus. And this is essentially a repository uh, of all the genomics data being done all over the world, um, UK, South Africa, everywhere else. And every time a new uh, coronavirus strain is sequenced, it's actually deposited and cataloged in this in this platform, in this next strain uh, platform. And I encourage you to visit the site. It's very informative if you want to learn about the virus evolution and, and, and virus diversity. It's a very interesting uh, website. It allows them also to have this sort of interactive features about where particular uh, lineages of this virus, how they're moving, where the polymorphisms are, and, and these sort of things. But what's really interesting about this, and really, the uh, again, it's this is the inspiration for uh, a lot of the things I do, uh, is that NextTrain is, first of all, an open source project. All the data is publicly available. All of the data is openly shared. You can go download data, play with it, analyze it, add your own data. It's really um, all open. Uh, the second thing, next train uh, generally doesn't generate its own data. So they're primarily actually curating and sharing public data, organizing the data that is out there. Uh, and finally, there's a huge investment there in, in data visualization and, and analysis. So that aspect actually is, is also very important. How do you share the data and, and turning all that raw data into something that is easy to use and, 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 and process. So uh, to cut a long story short and, and, and really uh, to sort of, we have moved forward with, with this idea of genomic surveillance of plant pathogen and it all culminated into this exercise where we, a group of us met in uh, Bellagio in Italy uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago now, uh, uh, led by uh, Monica Carvajal at SIAT uh, and, and came up with this um, policy forum and this concept of uh, a genomics uh, or a global uh, surveillance system, a GSS if you like, for crop diseases. Uh, things have been slow to develop beyond that, uh, mainly gaining funding and all that. But the idea in terms of genomics is really that we need a lot more data. We need a thousand times more data than we have today. This is very important. Again, I think we have now this, this current crisis with the coronavirus as a good example where having more data it is, is actually useful and, and provide useful knowledge. Also, speed is critical. Speed is really essential. We have to move fast to address these problems, especially when there are new outbreaks. We can do genomics directly from the field. We don't need to go through um, the tedious process of culturing, purifying strains, etc. We need to integrate genomics with all the type of data that plant pathologists collect. Uh, and, and there are wonderful platforms out there in terms of collecting phenotypic data, collecting data straight from farmers and all that. But that needs to be integrated also with the genomics data. And finally, the importance of open source and the consequence of open source really is crowdsourcing in the sense that now, once the data is open, anybody who has expertise and knowledge can actually contribute to the analysis. So this is where we are today. But what I'm going to do now is really take you through the, um, what happened between essentially 2002 and 2009, 2012 and 2019, sorry, I lost track there. Um, but, um, and, and since the essentially um, that kind of aha moment I had when I thought like, we really need to apply genomics to these problems. Uh, versus that GSS concept. What happened is we had a few emergencies that we uh, decided to address, and we decided to address them in a different way. It was very evident that we need a new way of doing business. The old way of doing business, the classical way, it's a very stratified approach. There's someone at the top, generally an organization, maybe CGIR center or something like that, essentially um, assigning people different tasks and, and this is done in a very structured way, which is not the optimal way to address a, an emergency. What we need is, is essentially what's on the right side there of that cartoon is, is a more um, interactive way, a little bit of a mess sometimes, but that's fine. Uh, it's okay if multiple people do similar things, but this allows to move in the fastest uh, 
way in addressing the emergency. Anyways, I'll, I'll show you how, how this works. So the first problem we faced was in 2013 was uh, a tree problem, actually an ash tree uh, problem. So ash dieback is the disease. It popped up in the UK for the first time in November 2013. Uh, it was very destructive. Um, interestingly, this type of problem gains media attention. As you can see there, it was on the cover of the Times magazine, even <laughs> Uh, you know, get more space on the cover than the new James Bond movie. So that's that's good for plant pathology. Hey, plant health is important, right? Uh, and as you can see there, it is really was really threat to um, to the 80 million ash trees in in, in the UK. Uh, the um, when we heard about that, that was the first case where we said, okay, let's let's kind of get involved with this. And we essentially within a month we released the genome sequence of the pathogen that helped identify its source, how it was introduced to the country. We also helped us realize that it is a sexually reproducing pathogen, very diverse, uh, which resulted in, in, um, in a different way really of dealing with the problem and also in terms of selecting trees that are resistant and all that. My colleague Doug, Dan McLean, who is shown there, uh, went on even to involve the public in a sort of citizen science type of uh, approach where he actually developed a game where the, the citizen scientists could play this game on Facebook, uh, which was solving a puzzle, which actually allowed us to improve the uh, calling of mutations and polymorphism in this, uh, in, in this project. He published all of this. If you're interested, I have to send you more information. And, and actually the players uh, can improve on, on existing uh, computational program. So that was an interesting uh, side thing from that. But the approach we used is, is interesting. Uh, so the, the methodology was really um, uh, doing uh, RNA sequencing, RNA-seq on infected tissue. Okay, so we don't need, this is why we could move really fast, is we didn't go initially through the process of purifying, culturing the fungus, etc. We just took the uh, tissue, sequenced it, and showed that that information we get uh, is actually very useful. First, in identifying which are the tree sequences and which are the fungal sequences. So you can see that cloud uh, on in the lower lower right there. Um, the infected tissue uh, in the infected tissue you could really clearly separate the, the sequences from the fungus from uh, compared to the plant uh, sequences. And that that's enough to give you a lot of information. Uh, enabling a very precise identification of, of this fungus. So we call this method field pathogenomics as a general way of basically generating uh, genomics data from infected tissue collected directly from the field without going through uh, through the process of culturing and all that. Obviously, this is really critical for non-culturable organisms. <laughs> then you can really move really fast. You don't actually have much option, uh, but it is useful for any kind of system. It's, it's a very fast pipeline to get genomics data. Okay, so now fast forward to 2016. So in 2016, uh, we came across a new uh, outbreak in Bangladesh. So these were the first reports uh, that there was a new disease on wheat that hasn't been reported before. It looked like wheat blast, but its origin, the precise identity of, of that strain was not, was not clear. Uh, whether it was an endemic strain that jumped to wheat or whether it was introduced, uh, that really wasn't clear. It was very destructive. 15,000, 16,000 hectares were destroyed in a short period of a month and a half or so. So uh, I, I, uh, we used social media then to actually connect with our Bangladeshi colleagues. So Tofaz Al Islam um, was someone I met at uh, plant pathology congresses a couple of times. We became friends on Facebook. I knew of him through uh, the Facebook connection. I knew he was quite a dynamic. Uh, fella uh, over there in, in Bangladesh. So I immediately sent him a um, message um, uh, on March 8th, actually, uh, 2016, asking him, well, have you, you know, can you get samples? Can we apply this, this method we have um, to, uh, to this problem that arose in, in, in your country? And he immediately went very active, actually used social media and, and a lot of the extension people there um, have smartphone, they're on Facebook. So he could immediately um, really get get into the field and 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 get us um, samples directly from the field. So um, so that really happened very fast. The um, and we decided to uh, 
do the sequencing as fast as we can and put all the data out there on this platform we called Open Weed Blast. Uh, so Open Weed Blast was our portal, which without doing any analysis, actually at that time I was I had no idea about Weed Blast. I, I really didn't work at all with, with this uh, pathogen. Uh, so we really needed input from, uh, from the community. So we, um, we posted uh, the data. There was a lot of um, media attention that came through that uh, on the cover of Bangladeshi uh, newspapers all the way to, um, to uh, international scientific magazines. And, uh, and what was fascinating is within weeks, really, we had people contributing analysis of the population uh, analysis of this uh, outbreak. So we had uh, two actually independent analysis, one by Daniel Kroll in Switzerland, and another one by Pierre Gladieu in France. And, and this really happened essentially six weeks. They posted their reports six weeks after field collection of the samples. So within six weeks, we went from field collection in Bangladesh all the way to going live with the website to having uh, the community contribute reports. Uh, and um, what was um, really uh, fascinating to me is uh, we needed the community input because there was actually only one genome sequence of a wheat blast strain that was public when we went live on April 18th. But then many members of the community said, we have this genome sequence, they're sitting on our servers, we haven't published them, we want now to contribute them to help analyze the data. At the end, we had something like 25 strains or something, 25 different genomes contributed by different labs. Uh, but essentially, nobody could really do the analysis on their own, on their own without the community coming together and sharing these resources. Uh, to cut a long story short, it turned out that the isolate was very likely introduced from South America, which is not totally surprising given that Bangladesh imported some uh, suspiciously looking wheat, let's call it like that, from Brazil uh, just months before the outbreak. So that's probably how the, the pathogen was introduced into the country. And, and again, with the timeline, you can see here that we posted the preprint in BioArchive in June 19. So literally uh, six months after um, the samples were collected uh, from the field in Bangladesh. And then we formally published the paper in a, in a journal, in a peer reviewed journal uh, in September. So essentially nine months after the uh, samples were collected. So I thought this was a really good showcase of how we could rapidly rally the community uh, to uh, together address, address a problem like that. You can see we had multiple authors, including folks from Brazil who also had their own data to contribute, et cetera. And, and again, the approach field pathogenomics, um, we could easily by sequencing RNA from uh, infected lesions and both symptomatic and non-asymptomatic. Um, uh, tissue, we could separate uh, fungal sequences from uh, from the uh, wheat sequences and the fungal ones are shown in blue there. So it was a, a little computational trick that allowed us to go really fast in, in analyzing the sequences and not delayed by, um, by culturing and, and, and all of that. So, uh, okay, this is the data. It's not really important, but uh, the point is that this Bangladeshi um, uh, population turned out to be a clonal lineage, single clone. We, we have been following it over the years. It's just a single clone uh, that is actually diversifying at its rate, uh, but it is uh, out of the South American uh, stock and uh, very closely related to South American uh, isolates. Uh, to, to kind of summarize what we did there, what we learned really is, first of all, we learned that genomic surveillance can be rapidly applied to monitor a new plant outbreak. And we can generate very valuable information regarding the precise identity and origin of the infectious agent. For example, the knowledge that we acquired in South America, the wheat blast uh, emerged in South America in the 1980s, uh, that knowledge could be immediately applied to Bangladesh uh, fungicides, cultivars, etc., that could be used. Uh, and immediately, um, CIMIT actually established a uh, field trial. Um, that was done in parallel with exactly the same material, both in South America and in, in Bangladesh, as a way of, 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 um, of testing uh, different varieties and how they perform. But the fact that we knew that it was similar populations of the pathogen was really important for arguing for, uh, for that investment. Uh, 
Uh, we also could identify through genomics the uh, effectors, the uh, virulence effectors, for example, and therefore guide which R genes can be used. So one gene that came out of that is RMG8. It's a gene that was not effective against uh, most of the Brazilian uh, populations of wheat blast, uh, but uh, the AVR effector is present in the Bangladeshi clone, and therefore RMG8 is effective against the Bangladeshi population, and that was an argument through sequencing to tell our uh, Bangladeshi colleagues to consider uh, using that gene. And they are indeed uh, testing cultivars with RMG8. And finally, the crowdsourcing. I mean, there's many aspects of this, uh, not just getting um, people in the world who are really the experts in this problem to contribute, but also bringing the community together. I think working together, get everyone to know each other, establish new uh, connections, new links, uh, and, and so on, and, and really um, um, uh, help set the stage for, for many follow-up analysis, which actually did happen in many cases, exchanges of visit of technology and knowledge, etc. So what are we doing uh, these days? As I said, we're following the, the, the Bangladeshi clone over the years. It's now uh, four seasons, and uh, we have four seasons of data in terms of genomics analysis. I don't really have much time to talk about that, uh, but one question that was really uh, of concern from day one was whether this pathogen newly introduced to Bangladesh in the greenhouse had a fairly wide host range, whether it was actually going to jump to other, other crop plants in particular, but maybe even to other grass hosts, and that would affect also the epidemiology. And uh, Bangladesh, unlike Brazil, uh, most of the field plots are actually quite small. We have typically small scale farmers. And as you can see here, for example, maize, which is actually susceptible to, um, to the blast fungus, uh, for example, is right next to a um, uh, totally infected field of wheat. And also uh, rice and, and wheat are often grown side by side. So we have an endemic population of rice blast. We have a new conspecific uh, lineage wheat blast introduced to the country. What's the potential for host jumps? What's the potential also for exchange of genetic material? Fortunately, uh, the suspicious lesions that were observed on maize turned out not to be wheat blast. So, so far, a jump to maize hasn't occurred in the field, at least. Uh, but to monitor this, uh, we um, uh, develop a variation on our method, which is based on amplicon sequencing. Uh, and this is really a brilliant method developed by my, my colleague Kurt Lamour in um, University of Tennessee. And he has actually a small company, Floodlight Genomics. Um, uh, applying this methodology. Uh, and essentially, it's a one tube PCR where you mix together um, a lot of primer pairs, uh, in his case, uh, 85 primer pairs uh, that uh, amplify different regions of the genome and, and reveal uh, the sequences of individual polymorphisms that are actually diagnostic for the population you're studying. So um, it's a very quick way. And then what, what you do is when you have all these multiple PCRs, uh, they're just actually pulled together and sequenced by uh, Illumina type sequencing in one go. So it's a very, they are barcoded and then sequenced. And then there's some computational work to extract the, the information afterwards. It's a very quick and cheap way of actually establishing uh, surveillance. And we showed that we can do this from, again, lesions collected in the field where you just extract DNA in this case from the lesion and, and run it through the PCR. And that's good enough to give you data that allows you to separate, in this case, the BD clone shown on the left side, uh, that error there with BD. Uh, so those are actually identical. They're all the same clone, different, um, different isolates uh, from, uh, from Bangladesh, from wheat. And then uh, we can really distinguish that clone from other South American wheat blast and any other active blast fungus, including local endemic rice blast um, isolates from Bangladesh. So this allows to see if there is a jump, a host jump, if the BD clone would move to a new uh, crop, a new grass, any suspicious lesion can be sequenced, analyzed. And also it will allow us to see whether rice blast can also move to other uh, strains and so on. So it's a good way to monitor essentially your population in a large scale fashion. The um, Methodology is very easy. Essentially, as I mentioned, we just collect lesions. Essentially, it's collecting herbarium type material. You, you basically collect lesions, dry them up, send them over to the lab, 
and then uh, DNA is extracted and, and, and run through um, Kurt's uh, pipeline. Uh, this is somewhat relevant to you in South Africa now, because what happened is there was a report just last September, September 2020, that there is a new outbreak of wheat blast in Africa for the first time in Zambia. And this is the scientist, Dr. Batiseba Tambo, uh, looking at the totally uh, destroyed, really, uh, wheat field uh, with the typical wheat blast uh, symptoms. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's really uh, tragic that the disease has now made it to, uh, to Zambia, to Africa. I was told that Zambia actually does export wheat to neighboring countries, uh, although so far, um, the reports are only of the rain fed grown wheat. So the so, so small scale farmers rather than the, the larger uh, farms that are actually the ones that typically export out of the country. Uh, so uh, the report only came in September. We actually didn't know about it. But um, uh, one thing that was a bit puzzling uh, to many of us, uh, especially because there were many um, international scientists involved in the publication is that although nobody knew about this up to September 2020, the uh, first outbreak was in the 2017-18 rainy season, uh, field season of growing wheat. So, so the um, basically the pathogen popped up three years ago, and then it took uh, quite a while before um, this was actually made public, and it was first announced through a formal publication, uh, plus one as you can see, a formal journal publication. So. Um, I would add that since the report came, we're now involved with our um, Zambian colleagues and CIMIT colleagues to analyze this um, population in Zambia. So we just received actually isolates from them, uh, from Dr. Batiseba just last week. So we'll be um, hopefully making data public uh, very soon, as soon as we have uh, sequences available. Same approach will be all through Open Wheat Plus. But this is a good transition to me, um, to the, a topic now, the, the last part of my talk, which is not really about science, but rather how we share uh, our scientific knowledge. How should we really act during emergencies, plant health emergencies? And I think the Zambian example is sadly uh, not a very good one in how we should approach uh, these problems. The problem is there, it's being done in a very traditional way. It's, it's done through scientific publications in peer reviewed journals. Now there's nothing wrong with that. But when you have an emergency, you can just wait for that. You can just wait for several years uh, until you have a, a fully developed paper that has gone through peer review. And sometimes with all the delays that it takes before actually you make the announcement that you have an outbreak. Uh, we really have to deal with uh, plant health emergency differently. Many challenges, as you can see in this slide, uh, funding is an issue, uh, collaboration, crowdsourcing versus a top-down maybe, or an individual type of um, collaboration. Open science, immediate release of the data versus journal publication. And I will discuss a little bit more about this publication concept because that's also changing a lot now. We have new forms of publishing like preprints and new ways of actually getting the data out there while at the same time, the scientists who develop that still get the credit that they deserve. And then finally, there's the issue of research assessment. Uh, currently, a lot of research assessment does not actually acknowledge the diverse contributions of scientists beyond uh, journals. And there's this unhealthy obsession with metrics. So let's talk about the new uh, models and new ways of communicating um, research. So we have a lot of new platforms we have preprints like BioArchive is the, now the go-to preprint server for biology. We have post-publication peer review in the idea that you actually post your paper and then it gets reviewed after it's being posted, after it's being shared with the community as a preprint, not before it is actually published. And then we have also um, uh, new platforms like Xenodo, which are um, uh, essentially uh, repositories for data, preprints, posters, anything you like. So these new forms of publication, they're summarized here. We have again the preprints. Um, preprints uh, tend to be fully fledged papers, but in many cases, we want to have actually shorter reports. For example, uh, here just 
reporting that you have sequences of certain isolates. Uh, you don't have time to analyze it or produce a full paper. In that case, these mini papers are appropriate for servers like Zenodo, uh, which are um, essentially um, servers that allow scientists to share data in any way they like, um, but without it necessarily being um, uh, complete for uh, a fully uh, developed paper. So it's, it's a stage between uh, your kind of lab report and a full publication. Uh, the key to all these is the fact that there is a DOI, a digital object identifier. What the DOI means that it becomes a citable unit because the DOI means once you post it, you cannot modify it. It will be there for posterity and it will be assigned a DOI identifier uh, which means that it is for most journals, for most uh, publications, it's something you can now cite, you can use it to stake prior priority, etc. So for example, our little report there about nanopore sequencing of magnapore isolates is uh, a report that is permanently uh, there as a Zenodo uh, technical note uh, that anyone can cite and actually it's been cited in, in journal, etc. But what's really important to understand is that this does not prevent you from publishing in traditional journals. Once you post these reports, preprints or mini papers, etc., you can still develop them into uh, papers that you submit to journals. Almost all journals uh, allow um, the publication of preprints and, uh, and pre uh, reports prior to uh, submission to a peer review journal. So again, the concept here is publish and filter not filter and publish. So that really turns the whole idea of publishing on its head. And it's obviously very rational and logical in the internet age where uh, we now can share information as fast as we can. And obviously this is extremely relevant for plant health emergencies. Uh, very briefly again, to explain this, uh, I, I suppose some of you are not familiar with preprints, but just to explain it with a traditional method, you submit the journal, this editor, anonymous reviewers, who would analyze it, and then it gets published. Now with preprints, you just post it as a preprint. It's immediately out there for anyone to read, anyone to comment on. Sometimes these preprints get reviewed. Some of your colleagues may send you comments, etc. But at the same time, you can also submit it to a journal and go going through the traditional process in parallel, in addition to your paper being uh, shared as, as a preprint. So essentially it's, faster way of communicating your science uh, to, um, to the community uh, and not waiting for the delays um, that peer review causes. So for example, the Zambian outbreak really, which was published in PLOS One should have been shared a year earlier. I was told it took a year for it to be published, could have been shared a year earlier as a preprint. And that would have alerted the community that there is indeed an wheat blast outbreak in Zambia, not waiting for this really slow, tedious process of peer review um, before it's actually being shared. Well, preprints are becoming very popular. They're very common in other fields of science like physics and math, uh, but in biology, it's fairly new. Um, BioArchive was created, what, in 2013, 2014. As you can see here, it's, um, it's becoming super popular and that this is even outdated now, I guess. The, um, the current numbers are probably off scale. Also, uh, with the uh, COVID situation, we saw uh, the impact of preprints. Uh, there was a surge really in uh, preprint uh, papers. Almost everything that's being published on COVID is actually first posted as a preprint. So if you want really an example of how preprints can really accelerate the communication and, and the exchange of information, then look at what's going on with, with COVID. And there was a number of articles even dating back as far uh, as uh, last May that discussed this preprint surge associated with the coronavirus outbreak. If you're interested in the topic, I highly recommend ASAP Bio, as soon as possible Bio is a very good uh, name to describe this movement, the preprint movement. They have an excellent uh, FAQ, which will address any of the questions or any of the concerns you have. Uh, so if you really want to know more about preprints, just um, visit this website. I told you about uh, also other forms of publishing beyond preprints, mini papers, posters, etc. Like for example, in my lab right now, we are regularly uh, publishing our posters 
in uh, in Zenodo, which means that your posters get an, uh, a DOI. Uh, they are actually citable units. There is an author list that is uh, formal. Uh, students can actually claim them in their CV and so on. So it's really good intermediate stage to make it more formal that the information you're sharing is actually uh, recognized uh, prior to to actually becoming a, a full fledged paper. And again, like uh, especially with for our work with genome projects, we first uh, publish uh, a report describing the data before we actually publish it, publish the analysis. So that's uh, what we've been doing with uh, with um, the BLAST project, for example. Uh, we created a community on Zenodo. You can actually create a community to collate and collect all these data sets. Sometimes people post data sets, sometimes they post videos, uh, images. Uh, so uh, this community is called Open Rise Blast, but you can imagine all kind of communities growing. Uh, for example, I can imagine a South African plant pathology uh, community on Zenodo where um, reports, posters, etc., are being published uh, in association with your uh, your own scientific community. And again, DOI uh, is very important to understand this because we all care about credit, and and of course uh, scientists are uh, need credit to uh, move on with their career, to um, uh, to apply for jobs and all that. So the DOI is a very important part of this thinking because that essentially make your uh, poster, your mini paper, your preprint, a formal publication that you can actually uh, refer to and cite. And that's really, really important. So I wanted to really uh, be a little bit thought provoking here and, 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 and really share these ideas I have. I, trying to be an activist for uh, for this new way of doing business, especially in relation to new uh, emergencies. I think that's really, really important. But at the end, we all have to make it happen, especially in terms of rewarding and recognizing uh, scientists. We really have to move beyond this uh, traditional view that we should use journals as proxy for the quality of the science that is being produced. Rather, uh, we should really analyze and, and, and evaluate the science itself uh, independently of where it's being published. I can imagine how a uh, report on, on, uh, on a new outbreak uh, in Zenodo as a preprint or as a mini paper would have a lot more impact than uh, a formal journal publication that comes only two years later. So you, you can make it happen. And I hope to see more of this uh, type of outputs from your uh, community. So thank you very much. Uh, this is my team. Uh, we have... Um, uh, different projects. I didn't talk about the NLR, the R gene work we do on immune receptors. Uh, some of that is on the internet. So if you're interested, you can check those talks. I have a group working on, on the BLAST uh, disease, that's BLAST off team, and then Adeline and Joe help everyone. Uh, and these are my colleagues at the Sainsbury Lab, um, really wonderful uh, place to work. So that's all I have for today. I'm not sure if I was on time or not, but hopefully there's time for uh, questions. And I suspect I'll be reading your uh, questions in the chat. So, um, so see you, uh, see you soon. Thank you very much.